Okay, we were about 80% through 14. And so let's we read it and we'll go on to finishing off Balaam, the last verse for Balaam. <coughs> Um, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, uh, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, uh, scarified, scarified, sacrificed. That's spelled wrong. Ice. It's the first time I've seen that, and I've looked at it over like ten times. Uh, sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. So let's go ahead and see what happened with Balaam, um, how this finally went out for him, how it, uh, how it worked out or didn't. And that's in uh, Numbers 31, verses um, 8. And there's some, really, there's some really cool things in this piece, so I extended it off a little bit to 20 so you can see the whole piece. And uh, if you remember, this is, this is a really good point for the fact that uh, Balaam, as we've talked about before, is a believer. And this, this actually sh shows the sin unto death. Okay? And the sin unto death is when a believer doesn't learn from God's uh, instructions and continually does what he wants to, um, and, and thereby pays that penalty. So it says, um, they, let's go to 7, it's that's paragraph. They, uh, they fought against the Midians as the Lord commanded Moses, that's in verse 1, uh, and killed every man. Among their victims were Ebi, uh, Rechem, Zerher, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. So all five of the kings were, were, were killed. Um, they also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. Uh, and we talk about that sword all the time, and this is where Balaam dies a sin to death. Because as you can see, even though Balaam had this position, his power, he'd be instructed to God, he'd fast, he'd do those things. He still continues to do evil. He still continued to, uh, and you can see from this, they, they list him with the kings of Midian. So you can tell that he actually got all the stuff he wanted, he got the money, he got the power, got the women and all the good stuff. But ultimately what happened is he, 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 was, he was executed. And there's a piece in the scriptures that talks about uh, being disciplined along with the world. And this is a good example of that. Okay? It doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It means that the consequences to evil is sometimes death, especially if you don't turn from it. Okay? So this is a good, there's lots of good examples in this particular verse that shows uh, what happens to Balaam. Is that even though uh, Balaam uh, could have been God's guy, um, we will meet him in heaven. Uh, he'll be probably uh, sweeping the streets or holding a pan. Something like that. <laughs> but he'll be there. Uh, verse 9, this I want to kind of go over with the rest of this. Because this is, this, is a, this is a lot of really cool uh, believer behavior in here. Okay, And what happens a lot of times is we skim over it like it's history, but we actually don't apply the doctrines. And, and, the, and the magic into understanding uh, the world around us and what God requires of us is to take the doctrine that we know and interpret it and we actually, what we actually see, so we don't miss a great point that God has in there. Uh, it's like I've told you before, is that you know, many times when you have a story, God's point isn't the story. You, if you think the story is it, you're missing it, okay? Uh, it's like the one with, um, um, with, with Jonah and the big fish. You know, if you think it's about Jonah and the big fish, you miss the point. If you teach your kids about Jonah and the big fish, you miss the point. You, you need to teach them the doctrine because doctrine can be applied to everything, every aspect of your life. The story, you have to be swallowed by a big fish before you can get out of that one, right? Before you can apply that one. So, um, in, in this case, uh, we're going to find out some more cool things. It says, um, verse 9, The Israelites captu uh, captured the Midianite women and children and took all the Midianite herds, flock, and goods as plunder. They burnt all the towns where the Midians, uh, Midianites had settled, as well as uh, all their camps. They took all the plunder and spoils, including the people and the animals, and brought the captive spoils and plunder to Moses and Elia, Eleazar, um, Eleazar uh, the priest, in the uh, Israelite assembly uh, to their camps on the plains of Moab uh, by the Jordan across from Jericho. Now, this all sounds pretty nice stuff. Now, watch what happens here. So I think this is kind of funny. Uh, but it tells us a lot about, um, you know, a lot of times when you learn something about them, it's actually about you too. Okay, and it's good to pick that up because uh, sometimes we get 
well, let me say, our nature is always to look at ourselves in the best light. Our nature is always to interpret everything by our intent, by everybody else, by what they did. Okay? So it, it's a danger. It's a danger of arrogance. So we always have to kind of be careful of that. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a thing to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that I talk about is that if you know you're weak, you're actually strong. Because then you don't depend on yourself. You depend on what God teaches you. You don't have any issue. You sit there and say, this is what God says, so I'm going to do that. But if you actually think you're smart, you'll apply what you think is right. And that usually doesn't match up with God's uh, fairly often. Um, so Moses, Eleazar, the priest, and all the leaders uh, of the community went to, went to meet them outside the camp. Moses was angry at, with the officers of the army. Um, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds who had returned from battle. So these are, these are the high, this is the echelon, okay? This is the higher people, uh, the echelons of this, of this group. Uh, supposedly, uh, these would be the, the, the more um, honorable, they would be the people who were uh, picked to hold these positions. So look, look who he's shooting at with this, okay? Um, he says in 15, he says, Have you allowed all the women to leave, uh, to live? Uh, he asked them. They were the ones, um, they were the ones uh, who followed Balaam's advice and were uh, the means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord uh, in, the, in what happened in Peor. Um, so the plague struck the Lord's people. Uh, now kill all the boys, kill every woman who has slept with a man. Um, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Now, what's interesting to me is that they managed to keep all the pretty women who caused the problem in the first place, okay? And uh, this is an important thing to understand because, I mean, women are different than men, but men, we kind of follow a theme, you know, <laughs> is that uh, we, we tend not to kill the pretty ones. And, um, and so, so my, my whole point in that is that um, they're thinking like men, okay? God's given them very, very specific instructions. Uh, they were given these instructions before. Moses kind of has to sit there and say, how many times do I have to tell you guys this stuff? You know? And, and, and they don't get the point. What, what they see is they, they see the pretty gals, because maybe these are the ones that, that caused all the problems. Uh, it wasn't theirs, it was, it was their religion. It was the way that they believed, and they were instructed to do that. But what comes out here is that they were not listening to the principle that God taught them. Okay, and that principle was that this is poison to you. This is this is how you got fooled the first time. This is how the, this is why Moses brings it up. This is how the plague happened. This is how those tens of thousands of people died, and you still didn't get the point. Okay? It's still going on. Yeah, still going on. Yeah, you're as stupid as you were before. <laughs> That's how that's I would say. But Moses drew it out very nicely. He's much more diplomatic. Um, and, and I like this part here too. Um, the, the part where uh, God's very specific. Now today, we have become so politically correct that we actually miss a lot of major points. Mm -hmm. Okay, One of these is here, is right here. Now kill uh, all the boys and kill every woman who has not slept with a man. Who has slept with a man. Who has slept with a man. Oh, oh, with a woman. With who a man, has. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm really getting confused here. Okay, so, but my whole point of this is you couldn't get that to come out of anybody's mouth today. It would not happen. That person would be jailed. They would be taught everything. So the whole point is this. Is and the reason I bring this thing, this is very similar to me as the Battle of Jericho. Okay? And remember the Battle of Jericho. A lot of people know about the Battle of Jericho, but in themselves, they don't actually understand God's principles. Okay? God's principles in war are really straightforward. Okay? Execute your enemy. Okay? Execute First case them. Of, uh, <coughs> urban renewal. Yeah, urban renewal. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and these particular people, well, there's a very specific reason for this, is because the religion of this culture was extremely damaging to God's people. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> okay, I don't want to go any further with that. But my whole, my whole point is that if you have an issue with this, or you have an issue with Jericho, and I'll remind you of Jericho, God did the same thing. He said, execute everybody except uh, Rahab and the family that she has set aside. Everybody. Every child, every animal, wipe it out. 
And most of us today would go, if we would not agree with this if this happened in our country. Okay? Um, and one of the reasons that he did that, you have to kind of understand God's point of view, is that the Canaanites were the most evil people and had the most evil religion that existed. That's why Canaan was completely wiped out. Okay? And we know that because every single time they violated that principle, we know that it destroyed those Israelites who were in their periphery. Right? Every single time they made a mistake on it, they didn't do what God told them to, it ended up destroying them. So the point is that God is right about that stuff. And that God is very uh, specific on his instructions. Many Christians uh, have the audacity to go to the New Testament and interpret something that, that's not there. Is that, you know, God is the God of peace. Okay? And he is the God of peace for those who love him. Okay? That means if you're not in that group, you're not on the right list. Okay? And if you decide to stay on that not, not right list, you will end up in a place called the wrath of God in the lake of fire forever. Okay? So that's how God deals with stuff. Okay? If your opinion of them are different than God's, then your problem is with you and God. Does that make sense? So a lot of times it's important to reconcile your thinking with what God has written very plainly. Okay? Uh, God's view of war is that, guess what? You go to war to win. End of conversation. Uh, a lot of people don't think that's right. They think that, okay, well, unless they shoot us at us, then we shouldn't shoot at them. And gee whiz, if we have these great big bombs, we shouldn't use those because they don't have those great big bombs. <laughs> it's like, okay, just wipe them out, okay? Save our men and wipe them out. It's called okay? rules of engagement. Rules of engagement, yeah. Uh, so my whole point is, is that watch the things that God teaches us. He's very, very clear. Okay? And if you have an opinion other than God's, that's, between you. that's your problem. Okay? But I'm telling you, when a country does not observe the rules of God, they have serious problems. They have great loss of honorable men when they shouldn't, when they're not supposed to. They have lots of losses. When you don't obey the law, bad things happen. All the time, people get murdered. Innocent people get killed. Children get killed. So obeying those principles are because God's written it that way. And those principles are always true. Okay? It's like, it's like, a, you know, it's like I always have to myself, is that whether I agree with it or not, it's not the point. God's right and I'm wrong. It's just, it's, a, it's the simple equation that has been true my entire life. And every time I've done what I think is right, it does not go well. Okay? <laughs> Ever. Um, so, um, let me see. So, he, so he's, he's fine keeping the booty. He's fine keeping the, um, all the stuff. Let me see how far we're going to go. Let me go to 20. Okay. Um, all of you who have killed... Now, watch this. This is another interesting thing. All of you who have killed anyone or touched anyone who's been killed must stay outside the camp for seven days. On the third and on the seventh day, you must purify yourselves and your captives. Purify every garment as well as everything made uh, of leather, goat, hair, and wood. Why? Why? Why does God have that there? Yes. We, huh? Part of the law. It's part of the law. That's right. It is their law. It's not our law. No. This is talking about being impure. We do not follow the Old Testament law. But my whole point is that God has a protocol and it applies, period. Now, what these men have done with respect to being warriors is absolutely honorable. Honorable to God and honorable to their country. Okay? When our soldiers execute an enemy, they are doing the right and godly thing. Okay? End of conversation. Okay? Uh, but God has a protocol here, and he, he requires the observation of that protocol. Okay? So this is why God's, God's rules are so important to us. If you don't know God's rules, you will violate them. God has protocols for all kinds of things. You know, um, I'll just break this, bring this up, not to poke fun at Billy Graham, um, because he's a man of God who's done uh, great things. But uh, Billy Graham has a piece that John MacArthur just shoots him full of holes with, and rightfully so. Is one of the things that he writes in one of his books is that uh, a person who believes in God will be saved. Okay, well that's absolute heresy. Mm -hmm. But he says it. I've read the book. Uh, and, John, uh, and John MacArthur just gets right on him about it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So why, why is that a big issue? 
is because it violates the protocol, okay? Um, that protocol is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Billy Graham knows this. This isn't, this isn't like new news to him, right? He's so probably been uh, the person who has been responsible for, as, as the mouthpiece of God, more people saved than anybody in our time, hands down. But he says this goofy thing, and he writes it in his book. And John MacArthur rightfully just shoots some full holes about it, just rips them to pieces. Uh, and what Billy Graham should say, I don't, I don't know if he has, but should, he should say, thank you, John MacArthur, you're absolutely right. I don't know what I was thinking. End the conversation. Okay, that's the, right, that's the right response. That's the godly response. But my whole point is that he violates the protocol of God, and no matter how great the man is, the protocol of God comes first. Always. Okay? So that's why I like this piece in here, is that it, it, it has this whole thing that we look at and say, well, what is that about? Why would you have, it's the law. It's the Mosaic law that's required to be followed. It's, they, are, they are reminded continually that they are a holy people chosen by God. And we need to remain the same thing. We need to always understand the protocol of God so we can implement it, whether we feel that way about it or not. Okay? So, uh, we got rid of old Balaam, or God did. <laughs> So um, this is one of those things that, what good is it to gain the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, except he didn't lose his soul, he just kind of trashed it. Um, the next book I'm going to go to is uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 21. It's in there someplace. Um, this, is, this is Paul obviously writing to the, to the Corinthians. He says, um, I'm afraid that when I come again with God, um, my God will humble me before you. And I am grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have, repented, no. have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. Now the reason I bring that up is because it's kind of the subject matter of this verse. Yet, it's thousands of years uh, after, in reality. I mean, um, the th years before. But what they're doing here is that, that's a mistake what I said. What it's saying here is that these, even though these Christians are in a different place, they are committing the exact same crimes against God in their sexuality in, um, in, in Corinth. Okay? And that's the whole point here. And the whole point he says here, um, it's the same one this one says, and it says, and they have not repented, okay? And repented, you know, we've talked about repented. Repented is not to feel bad, okay? If you think repenting is to feel bad, you're wrong, okay? But repented is the word metanoieo, and meta means to change, noieo means to think. It means to change your mind, okay? It means that you were going one direction, and now God's word showed you that direction is wrong, so you go back to God's direction. That's repenting. Same thing that happens when you're saved, right? You think Jesus Christ is a really nice guy, you find out he's not a nice guy, but, and I mean that as a lesser point, <laughs> that he is the Savior. He is, he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. So he's not this nice, sweet guy, which lots of unbelievers are perfectly willing to say, Jesus is a, he's a very... Philosophical guy, I agree with him. He's such a nice guy. And he's, he's, just, he's just wonderful. He's more than wonderful as your Savior. Okay? So that's, that's the object of repentance. So when somebody repents, what they do is they change their mind about who they thought Jesus was to who he really is. And that's the whole point here. They have not repented. These guys have not repented. Okay? And then we're going to go to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 18, 19. Let's go to 17. We'll throw 17 in there to orient us properly. Um, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And, and futility here means, the word is matayotes, and what it means is vacuum. Okay, It means in the vacuum of their thinking. 
Why do they have a vacuum in their thinking? Because the Word of God doesn't reside there. We are not like that. Okay? Believers can be, have, a, a, have a, a vacuum in their mentality, but if, if they do, it's because they do not know what God requires of them, which is a great shame. Okay? Now to 18. Uh, they are darkened in their understanding and separate from the life of God. What life of God is that? That's the holy life that we talk about. They are separated from the life of God. They cannot live the life of God. Okay? If you're an unbeliever, you cannot live any life that is acceptable by God. So before you were a believer, everything you did was worthless. It was rubbish. Okay? And today we have an opportunity to live a holy life, one that fulfills God's plan, one that blesses us and our family and others for eternity. Okay? But we have to choose that life. We have to choose it. Okay? And we've talked about that all the time. Because of their ignorance that is, uh, that is in them, due to the hardening of their hearts. Hardening of hearts is caused when you reject God's truth. That's what happens. Your heart, your heart gets hardened. And your heart is not this heart. There is no heart pumping blood heart in the Bible. Zero. Every single heart either refers to one of two things. Okay, it either refers to the old sin nature, like in Jeremiah 17.9, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? Or, in this case, it's talking about the heart, which is the center point of decision-making and hopefully the residency of God's Word in your, in your soul. Your soul exists actually here, in the gray matter, and somehow is used as a... As a our, our gray matter is used as a hardware for software that is, that is spiritual. For you guys who actually understand IT stuff, that's what that comes down to. Okay? Uh, and when the hardware goes away, the software is still there. So the soul is still remaining, even while we use these tents uh, for the time being. <coughs> if, if, you if you have everything on the hard drive, um, in reality, you can take all the periphery away. You can take the mouse, the display, the keyboard, and in reality, nothing changes about the, about the hard drive memory, right? Yeah. It's still there. That's, the soul is, very, is, a, is a good, similar uh, thing to that. Uh, reference uh, 19 having lost all sensitivity they have given themselves over to sensuality they have lost sensitivity okay losing sensitivity is not being sensitive it's the it's the awareness okay when you lose your sensitivity as a Christian you don't know right from wrong you don't know you don't know God for morality okay God does not, like one we talk about all the time, God does not want us to be moral. He wants us to be holy. He doesn't want us to bring our kids up to be moral. It's a low standard. Morality is for every human being in the, in the, in, in the human race. But spirituality is only for those who walk with God. Okay? Um, so they indulge in every kind of impurity with continual lust for more. Because that's what lust does. Lust never satisfies, it just brings a bigger vacuum. It can never be satisfied. Okay? That's the nature of lust. Okay. Let's go back to this piece here, so we know where we're at. Verse 14, again. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Okay, so we've gone over in 13, where he's talked about uh, Anipus, remember? Uh, he's telling them all the good things about them, how the mature believers. So this church is a very interesting church, um, is that it has one set of believers. Let me see, let's, put a, let's put a little thing in here. Okay. Um, it's kind of like this. Okay. It has the Antipas type. Right? Remember Antipas? Saint Antipas. He's the he's the mature team. There's a whole bunch of people. He's he's just the one that's mentioned, but there's lots of people out there. And then there's the medium people. These are the people who are just. Uh, they just come to church. And then there's these people who follow Balaam. Okay? And Nicolaitans, as we'll find out. Um, AP, something like that. But, so you have this great big piece of people, like in this verse and in this verse. Okay? And you have these people here who are kind of, uh, I'll call them uh, neutral. Okay. What, what God calls these people is lukewarm. Okay? Lukewarm. What does he want to do with lukewarm? Spit it out. You know something? Um, 
Everybody loves hot stuff. Okay, like coffee. I love coffee. I like ice water. <laughs> but when my coffee becomes lukewarm, I want to spit it out. Yep. Okay, and that's the nature of lukewarm. You, you, nobody likes lukewarm. And you have Anapus and, and the like, the mature believers. So this is all in the same church. Okay? Churches have this to them. Uh, we'd all like to sit down and think that, uh, that the holy people are all those people in our church, okay? There's not many churches that, are, that have this, okay, that have, this, that have everybody up here. Most churches are kind of like this, except hopefully I think it's actually probably more. Everything from hummingbirds to turkey buzzards. It, turkey buzzards, <laughs> yeah. We've got it all here, that's right, we've got it all. Hopefully this group is more down here, right? Um, but they all exist. And why is this important to know? This, this is doctrine. God shows it. He says it over and over and over again. Yet, Christians in general will trust other Christians. See, that's stupid. Just to let you know. Okay? Just let you know. Trusting other Christians is kind of stupid. Why? Because God tells you over and over again, these people exist. They are Christians. Balaam was a believer. Not a Christian because Christianity hadn't come yet. But he's a believer. He's a believer with a powerful gift from God. What does this tell you? Use your brain. <laughs> okay, Use your brain. God gave it to you for a reason. He gave you this stuff. He warns you over and over and over again, but you will never hear anybody say that, you know something, you should trust Christians a little less than most other people. Okay, you should. No, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. There's actually a logic to this. The reason that you do that is because they have, Christians who are down in this area have a great facade. They look really, really nice. They look really good. You know who knows the difference between uh, these people? God. God knows those people. Most of us wouldn't recognize these people if we fell over them. Okay? But they're in every church. Every single church without exception. Okay? It tells us in the Word of God that when, they, when their evil shows, it says that we are to remove our fellowship from them. Okay? Now, remember what Paul says, and, uh, and Joe read it a little while ago. No, I think Charles read it, actually. Um, it was in the verse in Corinthians where it says, um, I do not tell you to remove your fellowship from the world, but from believers. Why not the world? Because you'd have to remove yourself from all of them, yeah. right? Okay. And the other thing he says is that, what do I have to judge the world? That's not my job. That's God's job. But my job is when something's evil is obvious is to deal with it as God tells me to. Why? Because a little bit of evil destroys the church. That's why, this, that's why churches are supposed to be intolerant of it. Absolutely intolerant. Now, this does not mean we're supposed to be secret agents and go and look at everybody's private life. <laughs> private life is private. That's why God doesn't allow you into it. Okay? That's why God doesn't let people in, into your head. Why? Because it's private. It's between you and God. It's not for other people to know. Privacy is a great issue with God. That's why he does the stuff he does. Okay? But when it comes out, this is the part where, the, where you're looking for fresh water and it's salt. Right? Mm -hmm. remember, God, remember Jesus' analogy? He says, he says, how can you get fresh water out of a salt, of a salt well? You can't. If there's, if, there's, if there's salt in the well, you're going to get salt on the top. Right. Meaning that if there's evil here at the bottom of the well, when it gurgles up, guess what you're going to see? Evil. 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 <laughs> and if there's purity down here, guess what you're going to see? Purity. That's right. That's how it works. Okay? So when you see it here, it means danger. Danger, danger. Danger, danger. Okay? And it doesn't mean that you, um, it means that you remove the fellowship from those people. And like Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you... You have the church deal with that, the, 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 um, uh, the leadership, and they toss him out, if they, him, her, whoever it is, toss them out, if they do not repent, change their ways, and let who handle them? Satan. Mm -hmm. Satan. Let Satan kick their butt. That's what Paul says. Mm -hmm. Let Satan take care of this guy. He's much better at this stuff. <laughs> Satan does this real well. And when he comes back, that same guy, in second. Uh, Corinthians, and has reformed and repented, what do you do? Restore him back. You restore him back. That's right, you restore him back. So that's what that looks like. So um, the whole point of this thing here is that you have people who hold to the teaching of Balaam. This is a great indictment. 
Okay? This isn't like um, an individual. This is like somebody who is an evangelist. Okay? We usually don't think about evangelism outside of Christianity. But in reality, the world is continually evangelizing us in evil. Turn your television on if you don't believe that. Okay? Uh, it, it's, it's everywhere. The internet, even more so. Okay? So what he's telling these people, these people are evangelists. They are people who are uh, in that church who are just not, they're not just hanging out. They're people who are soliciting other people. Okay? They're soliciting other people how? Through sexuality, through money, through power. So these are individuals, not one, but there's numerous of them. It's yeah. happened twice in a church that I know of real well. Yeah, yeah. yeah think this destroys a church. Okay? It absolutely destroys a church. This is why it needs to be dealt with. Um, this would not exist if the leader of this church dealt with it. Okay? But the Lord's telling us he knows everything. Uh, entice the Israelites by eating foods sacrificed to idols and, com and committing sexual immorality. Okay. Let's go to 215. This is going to be a short one. Everybody have 15? Yes. Okay, the English is likewise. Uh, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Oh my goodness gracious. That's why I drew it up here. <laughs> this is like, you have a lot of people. These not people just like to bail bailing. These are not only the evangelists for the phallic cult and sexuality and power and money. They preach it, they teach it, they want to draw you into it. And what they will do with this, so that you know, they will present this. Um, in fact, the, the, um, this probably the best people we have around, these would be the name it and claim it people, if you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. They call them name it and claim it. Mm -hmm. These are the people who say that, uh, that if you just ask, if you just send money to me, I want you to know, if you send $10 to me, God's going to give you 100 okay? So if you, if you send me $100, uh, mm -hmm. he'll give you 1000 I, I can go up and up. Okay? I'm going to be a rich man enough for this conversation. But the whole point, and that's absolute rubbish. I hope you know that. God's not stupid, nor is he a slot machine. Um, you know, he, in reality, uh, when, you, when you handle your money appropriately between you and God, and there's a verse on that, that you give what God has taken you to give, what he's given to you. That's not 10%. We talked about it a lot. So it's, not, it's not a percentage. It, it, it may be much more. I don't know. It's between you and God. But when you give that with a heart that is grateful to give, God blesses that. You are blessed by that. You're happy about it. You have, a, you have the opportunity to share in a thing much greater than yourself. Okay. Uh, these people, the, the Baalamites, that we talked about before. These people are people who teach that in a way, in a religious way. Okay, like the lame and claim it people do. Okay, uh, so it is a religious tone. They will make this that you know, God requires this of you. Okay, mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't quite run through the sexual part yet, but I bet that's pretty interesting to hear. Uh, but the Nicolaitans uh, are very much these are people who exist in their church who actually believe it. Okay, uh, they probably have some of both. But these guys right here, uh, if you remember the Nicolaitans, uh, we'll talk about them in a second. So let's go to the, the, the Greek part of it. It says, uh, so to hold, um, this is an analogy, a verbal analogy, to the teaching. This is the same teaching that, that the Daskalos we talked about before. It's a, it's, a, it's a teaching that somebody tells you, not one that's a conversational one. So they're dictating the, the, uh, the doctrine. But that doctrine is an evil doctrine, okay, of the Nicolaitans uh, in the same manner. Um, one of the things I want to note here is that we talked about here is the contrast that we have with these, these three verses. This is uh, verse 13, verse 14, verse 15. And this is the uh, Pergamum, or Pergamus. Pergamum, Pergamus, either one. But this is the contrast. Look at the contrast that is in this church. And remember, this is, this is where the throne of Satan is at, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that there is lots of idolatry here. Okay, this be simply like Las Vegas or maybe Reno. <laughs> I had to throw a sentence to get big some building. <laughs> um, so, but in reality, what does it tell you? It tells you that it, one thing that's really important to tell you. It tells you it does not matter where you're at. You can be mature or you can be down here. God's word will protect these people from the influences of this. 
as well as if these people don't ask for that protection or get that protection by obeying the word of God, they will fall to it. Okay, they succumb to it. Okay, so there is there is what's called in, in scripture is called a, a ring of fire around these people where they're protected. If you, you can remember the story, I'm trying to remember the. Um, I think it's Elijah where he talks to him. He's, in, in, he's talking about a battleground. He talks about, oh, see all the angels out there? And remember this guy? I can't remember this guy's name. Um, but he's trying to tell the guy. And all of a sudden, God lets the guy see it. And he sees this army of angels around them that they're protected. And, and very similar to us in reality is that as a Christian, when you follow God's word and you walk with him, that protection is around you. Nobody can harm you. Nobody. Nobody or no thing. Not Satan himself, as you can see. Throne of Satan, this is, like, this is the home place of all idolatry. These guys are, are mentioned in the Word of God because they are so mature. They, have got, they got it. Okay. Um, the, um, and I was going to remember uh, the, same, the second, same Nicolaitans were rejected by the Ephesians, remember? On, um, on 2.6. Let's just go back to that for a second. The paper must go back to it. Like flip the pages. This is one of the honoring things that the Lord uh, says to them. He says, um, verse 5, even though you're complete boneheads, that's what <laughs> verse 5 says. <laughs> verse 6 says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Note the word is practices. Okay? He does not hate the Nicolaitans. He hates the practices of the Nicolaitans. When you, when you hate, if you have a hate for sexual, homosexuality or something that is perverse, it is the practice of that sin that you hate, not the person. Mm -hmm. Many people have come from that side to become great believers. Okay? There is no sin. We have in our group, in this scripture, uh, two men who were murderers. Okay? Moses being one, the highest on the Israel side, and Paul being the other, the highest on the Christian side. So we have no room to speak. We're all grateful to be here. Okay? So that's the Nicolaitans. So we know um, that, they, that the, the Ephesians um, rejected the Nicolaitans, but many of the believers accepted them in Pergamum. Okay. Now let's review Nicolaitans so we know who they are. This is kind of a refresher course from 2 to 6 because uh, it mentions they're a combination of Gnostics. Uh, they're a combination of Gnosticism which is, remember, Gnosticism it, it, it is um, um, Gnosticism is kind of, the best word I like for it, it's kind of a mysticism. Mystic. Mysticism. Um, and I would say one of the guys who I think is this kind of guy, uh, some of his stuff is like, and I don't want to be unfair to him because he writes some good stuff, a man named A.W. Tozer, who a lot of people respect and he writes some good stuff, but he has some of his stuff that has a mystic side to it. And what that does is it, it predisposes you to trusting something that is not written in God's Word. Okay? And that's dangerous. Um, my mother uh, practiced tongues, and uh, she was a, a wonderful believer. And um, one of her things that she said to me, we had the last conversation we had about it, about tongues. She, she stopped talking to me about it. But um, once she says, she, I, was I was telling her that you know, tongues is an extant gift. It's gone. It was only had a really specific purpose, and that was to evangelize the Jews in, uh, in Gentile tongues to insult them, okay, and to also warn them that. Israel as a, as, a, as a country and as a religion would be wiped out. Okay? That was in 70 that, AD. That was, those were known tongues. They were known tongues, yeah. They were known tongues. They weren't the gibberish you hear yeah, today. Yeah. You know, they were actually, yeah. Well, I, well, I said to the folks a couple of nights ago, anything that happens inside the body of Christ has to edify the entire body. Right? And they have requirements. Yeah. yeah. First Corinthians has requirements. Is that if you speak in tongues, you cannot speak unless you have an, an interpreter. interpreter. Yeah. Guess what? You don't find any interpreters who love tongues tongue 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 because they don't exist. <laughs> nobody, nobody understands gibberish. <laughs> um, so this, well, my whole point with her was that she said, she said to me when she was talking about it, she said, but you don't know how it feels. 
Uh-oh. And you know how that went well with me, right? Yeah. 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 So, so my, my, you know, my comment would have been, right? So you're telling me that feelings override the Word of God, Mom? Yeah. Last conversation we had. Um, so I don't, think she, I don't know if she got the point, but she's in heaven, so she's smarter than me today. Um, but she knows, beware she knows, of mysticism. She knows you're right, though. Yeah, she knows I'm right now. Yeah. 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 I'm, sure, I'm sure somebody pointed it out. Let me read this verse to you. Uh, and she wouldn't mind I was a little fun. Uh, but mysticism is a dangerous thing. Uh, and Gnostics were mystics. Uh, they were the ones that didn't say, you know, the true people, the true holy people, the people who really know God, get that information from angels. Have you ever had an angel come talk to you? You, Charles, you haven't? Oh, well, well maybe, maybe one of these days you'll be as holy and smart as me. After that's what they did. Of scotch. Okay, that's what they did. Yeah, the scotch. <laughs> Not going to happen, right? <laughs> so the whole point is that it is this, there's this something that's there that's not somehow in the Word of God. He's given it to privileged people. They discovered okay. something. They discovered this something, yeah. And Gnosticism is just exactly that. It, it, it's built around things like uh, intellectual. Okay. There's nothing wrong with intellectual because, they, but they do tend to be the last to get the point of God, right? <laughs> um, and, and that's just true. Uh, well, they're hard to understand. Yeah, that's because they tend to go over this direction. It, sometimes what happens is the. The smarter you are, the stupid you are. And this is the part that God talks about. He says, the, the dumbest thing that God has ever thought of is higher than the greatest man who's ever thought. Okay? And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's not a truism because they're not even related. But it's, it's, a, it's an analogy that Paul makes. You know, the, the weakness of God is greater than the strongest man. You know, he, he make, you remember that part of Paul's bringing up, up in the conversation? Is that, is that why Jesus was, is that why he was, when he was relating to children, coming to him as children? Because they... Because they don't have that? What happens is that, and then most people don't talk about this, but you're familiar with this, is that what is the very first knowledge that you have as a, as a, as a person? Faith. You know why 2 plus 2 is 4? Because your mom taught you it before you ever understood it. And you said, okay, mom. <laughs> you did it on faith. You, your first basis of language is on faith. You have no empirical knowledge. You have zero experience, and you don't know nothing. Okay? I use that on purpose. But <laughs> intellect tends to be held higher than faith because it's arrogant. Okay? Mm -hmm. Trust me, this is God's currency. That right there is God's currency. And God here, he is that intelligent. He is infinitely intelligent. Okay? This means that the one of the Paul's jokes is that the smartest person who has ever lived is a moron when God talks to him because he's stupid, okay, compared to God. That's okay. I mean, if, if you, and what happens is that when you become the person, when you understand who God is, you get that and you humble yourself because you get it. You get to say, okay, let me see. God is the one who knows where every single electron has been since the time he created it. There's never a time that he did not know where they were all at. And he will know where they all at forever. And not only that, he has always known before he even made them. Okay? That's God. There's nothing that has ever been thought or done that God does not know. God will never learn anything. Ever. Why? Because he knows everything. He not only knows what is, but he knows what could be. Potentiality. Okay? So this is this part right here. So this is dangerous, okay? This is dangerous to Christians because it appeals to the arrogance of intellect, okay? Intellect is fine. There's nothing wrong with intellect. It is a nice tool. It's like money. It's like power. It's like all the other stuff. It's a tool, okay? If God gives you insight, it's not mysticism. It's the Word of God, okay? It's that simple. Okay. And God has given knowledge more to some than others. He's given more to these people. But he has not withheld it from you or from me. God's never the limiting factor, ever. Does that make sense? God is never the one who sits there and says, you know, Richard has to teach this class, but I don't think I'm going to let him know today just to show him who's boss. Okay. He could, but he doesn't do that. God is never the limiting factor. He's never the limiting factor in our blessings, 
He's never the limiting factor in our prosperity. He's never the, in the limiting factor in our happiness. If you're unhappy, it's because you have walked away from God. If you are not blessed, it's because you have walked away from God. Okay? If you do not understand the Word of God, it's because you have not spent the time with the Word of God. Because God never limits it. Okay? Ever. He is infinitely for you. At all times. Never a time when he isn't. Um, so that's, that's the mysticism part. That's what, that's what Gnosticism is. It's a dangerous thing. It is still around today. It still plagues churches. And it shows up all the time. Okay? So the Nicolaitans were this strange combination of Gnosticism as, as well as they were the Phalic cult. They mixed the two together, which is religion by sexuality. A very popular church. Okay? They have a huge congregation, I'm sure. Um, so let me see. Okay. Got that one, that one. Uh, the parts that it does do, as we talked about, it does it by religious. Idolatry. Uh, is there th idolatry is their system of theology. Okay? Idolatry is their system of theology. Just like we have the Word of God, idolatry in the, in, in, in the, in the altar of demons, which Paul talks about, is that same altar for them. They have a parallel. Satan does not have the ability to create things on his self. He is just a creature. So all he can do is mimic. He's like us. Okay? Smarter, more powerful, and uh, evil to an infinite degree. But he's just like us. He's a creature. Okay? He's a creature. He does not have the ability to create. He only has to, the, the ability to uh, mimic, copy, and distort. Okay? That's what he has. <coughs> the modus operandi is drunkenness. And drugs. The two greatest troubles in this country, in my personal opinion today, is drugs. Mm -hmm. And drugs is a way to get you to, for your heart, your mentality of your soul, to be disarmed so it can give you stuff that is not true. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you have anything to preach, preach that drugs are horrible. <coughs> they will be the destruction of this country. Mm -hmm. Okay? Alcoholism, alcoholism is his little brother. Okay. Nothing, there's, there's nothing wrong with alcohol. I mean, the Word of God says that. You don't have to have me hell yeah. Um, Jesus made it, right? First miracle. But there's a place for it. Okay? And drunkenness is a sin. Period. But people who get drunk put themselves in the same place that drugs do, is it makes their soul not protect itself. Okay? And remember the scripture where it says, it's important to keep your heart intact to defend your soul. And that's why sobriety, mentality, and, and keeping your head clear in the Word of God is so important. It's what protects you. It is your guardian. Okay? Don't do anything that hurts it. Uh, fornication, partying, ecstatic experiences, the selective tongue stuff, uh, sacrifice to idols, that's all their stuff. Verse 16. Wow. Where's Owen? And you thought it couldn't be done, right? I know. <laughs> actually, I think there'll, there'll be a time when we're actually probably in, in chapter uh, 6, 7, 8, and when we start getting those, we'll actually be covering four or five verses at a time because some of the stuff there is not doctrinal. I mean, it's not... That's stupid. Sorry. That was stupid, okay? Um, it is doctrinal, <laughs> but it's a point of what's happening, and uh, you look at them collectively. So if, if the... If the uh, if things are coming out of the earth and things are dying, it's all one principle. Things are dying. Okay? <laughs> uh, so you, you can tell what the word is. You can make relationship to it. But more or less, when you, when you get to some of that stuff, you have like four or five verses. And it's a really, really bad thing, really bad things that's happening, all kinds of destruction, but they're just one thing. Mm -hmm. that makes sense? So you can't, uh, there's uh, not stuff. So the Lord, what's interesting to this, this tells us something, okay? This is pretty nasty stuff, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, this is pretty horrible stuff. This is pretty horrible stuff even for when, when it's not Christian. But this is pretty horrible stuff. Well, look at what the Lord says. So if you want to understand God's grace, look at his first word here. Repent. Repent. He doesn't sit there and say, I'm done with you characters. He says, repent. So what I love about this, this is what tells us who our God is. 
God says, if you're still alive, no matter how stupid you are, if you will turn back to me, I will take you back. I will bless you. I will guide you. Nobody's like that. Okay? And we don't like to think we're that nice. I'm not that nice. Can people, I mean, I'd have to really pray about it, and God have to work on me quite a bit. Uh, because sometimes I'm not the most forgiving guy. Okay? Um, when somebody really, really hurts you and does really, really bad things, I don't know about you, but I, I'm not usually, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, just repent. We're good. But that's how God is. God is like that. He is infinitely grace, gracious, especially to his children. Okay? And even to who those who are not, right? If you're, in, if you're in the last minute of your lives and you repent and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, guess where you go? Heaven. Heaven. Guess what you have? Inheritance of Christ. Just like everybody else. Not much else. I don't know about you, that's a pretty good deal. Oh, yeah. uh, the only problem is that if you do that, you spend your whole life in horrible stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you die and get to go to heaven, that's cool. But you could have fixed the other stuff, right? I mean, that'd be kind of smart to do. Um, so he says repent. Uh, therefore, otherwise, ah, this is the other side, right? Otherwise, I will come to you and will fight against them. Them who? These people. Them. Repent. Or I will come against them. I will fight them with the sword of my mouth. Ouch. Remember that sword? <laughs> remember, remember, remember in, in, in 19 where the Lord is on the white horse and he's coming down. And he, what happens? And the sword comes out of his mouth. And that's the same one he uses to wipe out the battle of Armageddon. Millions of people are, are killed like that from that same sword. Probably should know something about that sword. And are these unbelievers? No, these are believers. These are believers. Okay? So, uh, this is how God is. God wants you, whenever God disciplines you, He always disciplines you not to hurt you, ever to hurt you, always to help you, always to have you come back because He knows that you're hurting yourself and you're hurting others. And He doesn't want you to do that. He loves you. Just like you love your kids. Same, same mentality. Is that, when, I mean... Okay, I confess, there have been times I've wanted to hurt my kids. Um, I haven't, but uh, there's times I've wanted to. But God's not like that. The reason I say that is God's not like that. God never wants to hurt us. He always wants to discipline us. And the only thing that happens sometimes is sin to death, like Balaam was, is that, you know, Balaam, you could have done a lot of great things for God. But you insisted on doing evil things, so guess what? You're coming home. End of conversation. I was going to give you another 30 years, but nope, we're done. Sorry. That's the sentence to death. That's what God does with us. And, we, and I'm not talking about, you know, you've been evil, and I mean, you really couldn't come to this class on a regular basis and be evil. It's really hard to do. You know? um, but my, my evil doesn't last very long because I have to pray and I have to do Bible study, you know? So it doesn't last very long. When I get on my knees, I have to give it up or don't come, one or the other. Um, so my whole point is that, that of this piece is that God doesn't sit there and say, okay, you've been evil for a week, you haven't talked to me for a week, and now I'm going to spank you. No. Uh, he may make you feel bad. Okay? You'll feel lost. You'll feel unstable. And that's a consequence not of God punishing you. God hasn't punished you. That's, that's a consequence of not being rooted in the Word of God. If you ever have a ment mentally time where you feel unstable, it's because your mentality is not rooted in God's Word. You can fix it real quick. Mm -hmm. Repent, start remembering the promises of God, and all of a sudden, amazingly, you go, I feel great. Let's, let's get it life. Let's get something done here. Okay, that's, that's who God is. It, it's, it's the best bet ever. I'm saying that's because it's Reno. <laughs> um, so the Greek part of it says... Um, uh, a change of mind, therefore. And, and, and the change of mind is, he's talking to believers, and this is a command voice. It's an imperative. So he's saying, repent. Repent of this behavior. That's what he's saying. Okay. Um, or otherwise, furthermore, bad things, I will come to you soon. Soon does not mean, uh, soon does not mean immediate. It's like the, um, it means that any time. He will pick that time, okay? And trust me, when God disciplines you, he never picks the right time for you, okay? <laughs> but it is always the right time, okay? 
If those who you have, uh, those of you who have experienced the discipline of God, most of us have, it's very personal. Uh, it's very uh, usually it's very private. Amazingly enough, God many times His first disciplining us is not public; it is private. Meaning that He disciplines you in a way that only you know. You feel that pain. Okay, you feel it personally and individually. It's a way that He gets to you that you get it. You go ah. Oh. Oh, that hurt. Nobody else knows it hurts. You do. Okay? This is kind of uh, cool because he's fighting for us. He's fighting for us. That's yeah. right. He fights for us all the time. You know, and that's, the, that's the cool thing about it. You know, a lot of times people, and I'll just end with this piece, a lot of times people sit there and they, and they go through all this guilt rubbish. And guilt is rubbish. Guilt is a sin. So if you feel guilty, you're committing a sin. Okay? Uh, what God says, God's word says, is that get over yourself and come back. Get over yourself. Yeah, you're stupid, but you were stupid to start with. Okay? You, you're no smarter than you were before. Just come back so I can help you not to hurt yourself. All God's rules and principles are not designed to make us less happy. They're designed to make us truly happy. There's a lot of difference there. So we'll come back to this here next week. And that's it. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, um, there's no one like you. Uh, you are awesome. You are wonderful. You love us. You, you do want us to be happy. Your happiness you want to share with us. When we walk with you and we do your will, we are happy because we have your happiness in us. Lord, help us to understand that you are always on our behalf. There is never a time when you are not on our behalf. And that you accept us even when we're dirty. You accepted us when we were filthy in salvation. I pray, Lord, to help us to remember your truth and remember who you are. And when we get in trouble, to come back to you, no matter what. I ask this in Jesus' holy, perfect name. Amen. Amen.